Our next talk is by Clara Ramon and Martina Mueller from the University of Rhode Island. Well, Martina and I are both going to be talking about um, waterfowl in Narragansett Bay. And oh, I should also mention that um, you know Scott McWilliams and Peter Page should also be on this, but I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so the part that I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is the historical abundance and population trends of waterfowl in Narragansett Bay, and then I'm going to kind of turn the podium over to Martina and she's going to talk to you about uh, seasonal patterns of waterfowl in relation to aquaculture. So these two sort of uh, parts of looking at waterfowl in the bay. So, winter and waterfowl. So if you've been birding in the last, I don't know, a couple months or something, you've probably noticed that New England in general is a pretty good spot to see winter and waterfowl. And, um, and when I say waterfowl, that I mean ducks, geese, and swans. Um, and the reason is for that is that although many of these birds tend to breed more inland in the Pampo region or um, in the boreal forest and things like that, they actually utilize a lot of coastal areas and estuaries um, in the winter for all the same reasons we use these areas as well. So we want to go for you know good habitat, we want to go for good ocean, and we want to go for a good sea. So the same sort of thing. Pleasant living conditions. Um, and so the problem with this is that these areas where waterfowl tend to congregate in the wintertime also are areas that are where they're most likely to interact with humans. So for example, if you look at this um, range map of uh, American black duck um, from eBird over here, um, you can see that this is sort of the area nope. <laughs> Uh, this area over here is where they're mostly wintering in the uh, you know blue and the purple color. Um, but if you look at this uh, map of I'm not getting the hang of this. Okay, if you look at this map of the um, population density by county in the U.S. of A, you can see that that same area is actually where there's a lot of population density um, happening as well. So. Um, you can actually see that you know, um, you know, those areas in New England and the Atlantic coast where the black duck um, is congregating in the winter time is also areas where they're more definitely more likely to interact with humans um, because it all is on the coastline. So that leads to a high potential for. Um, interactions with humans, as I've been saying. Um, and these interactions can be direct, so things like hunting, aquaculture development, stay tuned for what Martina's going to talk about, um, fishing, all of that can directly be impacting the waterfowl, but they can also be indirect. So um, these things can be, um, you know, human encroachment along the coastline, degradation due to pollution and things like that, um, and uh, other degradation due to, you know, climate change or uh, other development. So, although you don't often think of you know, foraging during the winter potentially affecting the breeding success of uh, a lot of different bird species, um, this can actually really be the case for waterfowl. So that's why winter is such an important time of the year for these birds. So, um, you know, for example, pair formation often takes place on the wintering grounds um, in a lot of waterfowl species. So that's sort of like a precursor to the whole breeding season. And also, waterfowl generally need to start building fat stores on the wintering grounds in order to have successful nests. You can kind of think about it like this. Um, if you are eating a lot on the wintering grounds, you're going to be a really good fat bird. You're probably going to have some good breeding success. If you aren't able to eat as much, um, and you're going to be a leaner bird, and maybe you're not going to be able to brood. Um, so these interactions on the wintering grounds can actually directly impact how much of a the population there's going to be. Um, and yep, that's it. <laughs> um, so in order to sort of 
look at this, um, we wanted to see what was happening with waterfowl populations in um, you know, their wintering locations in coastal areas of New England. And the way we wanted to look at these things is to look at whether waterfowl populations are changing over time. It's basically, are they getting smaller or are they getting bigger? Um, and we wanted to look at this at both uh, regional scales and maybe larger scales. So, what we did was we looked at um, waterfowl populations in Narragansett Bay because it's a pretty important uh, winter and waterfowl habitat. And uh, Narragansett Bay is one of the largest um, bays and estuaries in New England, and it provides a ton of habitat for things beyond just um, winter and waterfowl, but um, all sorts of um, species of fish and shellfish, uh, over 200 bird species, and several marine mammals. So it's a pretty important area. And um, we were able to actually take advantage of two long-term surveys that have been done in Narragansett Bay um, for varying amounts of time. So the first one being the Christmas bird count, which you guys are probably familiar with because it is an Audubon um, led endeavor. Um, and then there's an annual Narragansett Bay Winter Waterfowl Survey. So the Christmas bird count occurs each year in the US um, across the entire United States. I narrowed it down to look at just the Christmas bird count locations in Rhode Island. Um, and what happens is that volunteers, um, like any of you guys, go out and you count um, all the bird species that you see in this 24 kilometer circle. So these are all the different um, count circles in Rhode Island. And these count circles, they've been doing the counts in Rhode Island since 1901, but um, they've changed a little bit over time. So we actually just narrowed down for consistency the data to be just between 1975 and 2020. Um, so that they're exactly in the same location every single time. The other survey type that we used was Narragansett Bay Winter Waterfowl Survey, and this has been conducted annually in Narragansett Bay since 2004. And it's a group of um, experienced biologists and volunteers that go out and they cover as much of the bay as possible in an entire day. So what how this works is there's all these um, public access points around the bay. And in general, there's different routes that are given to different groups of people that go out. And so we're getting a sort of snapshot of what's in the bay on a given day in the winter. Um, so, um, you know, uh, one group might start um, over here um, and count all the way down to the coastline where another group might start over here in this economy route and, and do all of this, and that would be at the same time so we know we're not counting the same birds and things like that. So the, since the Winter Waterfowl Survey the, of Merrigan's Bay um, is only asking people to count waterfowl, <laughs> um, we used the species that were counted by that survey to guide the how we're, how we're going to analyze and compare and contrast to birds that were also counted by the Christmas bird count survey. Um, and so overall, there were 19 species or species groups that were counted by the Winter Waterfowl Survey and the Christmas bird count, and you can see them all up here. And just as I mentioned before, there were a couple species groups, so not individuals. So um, the scoters, because they often tend to be farther away, and occasionally people will count them as I know it's a scoter, but I don't know which one. We grouped all the scoters together, and so all three scoters are just sort of the scoter species um, idea. And the same goes for scop, because often scop are in very large flocks, and it's very hard to tell uh, lesser and greater scop apart. <laughs> so the species that were most abundant in Narragansett Bay, on average, for both survey types, were um, the scop species. Like I said, they often are in very large flocks. Um, the Canada geese, brant, common eider, um, bufflehead, and golden eye. Um, and so these are species that you know are re relatively common in the bay. Mm -hmm. 
There, are, on the other end of the spectrum, there's also a couple species that were so uncommon uh, during these counts, just based off of where the counts are happening and the fact that it's not happening. Maybe um, these aren't actually super um, common species in this region um, that we weren't even really able to get at abundance trends for them because they, you know, maybe they're seen in one year but not seen for another five years, and then there's one another one and things like that. So um, we weren't able to get. Um, enough numbers of king eider, common mergansers, hooded mergansers, or barrows golden eye. So we kind of excluded them from this trend analysis. So of these 19 species, once we looked across all the different, um, um, once we looked at their populations over time, these were species that haven't really changed um, over both surveys. So basically since 1975, they've been relatively stable. So uh, Brant, uh, swans, uh, mallards, the, um, this is wrong, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll see it in a second. Uh, but either bufflehead and the scops, uh, the, the scoter species are uh, relatively stable um, populations in space, so they're not changing very much. On the other hand, there were um, several species that did have um, significant changes. Um, since 1975 or since the beginning of the Narragansett Bay Winter Waterfall Survey in 2004. So here's the actual data that we looked at. So this is um, for annual trends for uh, red breasted mergansers, and what you can see here is just the, um, the count of red breasted mergansers over here, and then over here is just the year, and uh, the Christmas bird count, because it's been going on longer, is in red, and the Narragansett Bay Winter Waterfowl Survey is in blue. And so for red breast and mergansers, what we found is that it's been uh, decreasing over time um, in the bay. That's also true for American black ducks, um, as well as um, common golden eye, Harlequin ducks, although the story with harlequin ducks is a little bit more interesting. So harlequin ducks have actually been increasing since 1975 until about uh, 2000, and then they've uh, started to have this steady decline since then. Um, so greater and lesser stops are pulled together, remember that? Um, they've been declining since 2004, but prior to 2004, we didn't we didn't see this sort of um, decline that's happening in the Christmas bird count data since uh, since 1975. So prior to 2004, they seem to be doing okay, and they're sort of slowly declining now. Um, and the same story for that um, as this as the stop is happening with American widgeon. Um, and with gadwall. Um, so all of these are declining in more recent years, but haven't been declining over that longer time scale. Um, interestingly enough, there's um, been a significant change in the Christmas bird count data for Canada geese. Um, and so these data, um, the Canada geese haven't really, weren't really um, changing too much until the Early 2000s, they started to increase, and now they're back to declining, but this could be to, um, for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about in a second. So are these trends reflected at a larger scale than just Narragansett Bay? So if you remember, the, the bay is really important in this region, but it's relatively small in comparison to maybe the whole wintering range of these species. Um, and so we wanted to see okay, is this the same sort of trends that are being seen at different scales? So we looked at papers that looked at um, the you know, abundance trends of these species at, in different uh, bird conservation regions in, in New England, and then also at a more continental scale. And we wanted to see if things agreed. And what we found is that for um, species like the um, harlequin duck, and um, yeah, well, they're, they're decreasing in Rhode Island, but um, if we look at papers that have looked at them in you know, the larger New England um, management areas or the, at a continental scale, they're actually increasing over time. So this could be that these populations are um, 
just maybe moving outside of the bay um, into different habitats around it. Um, potentially, um, there might be something going on specifically within the bay that isn't happening in their larger um, range. So it might not be as dire as we thought is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Um, at, however, for other species, um, we have some species where there was, so here I have just, um, if, if we didn't really have data for it, I just put in a, a line here because other studies didn't study that, so just so you know. But um, in, um, so several species, you know, the trend in Rhode Island is reflected at a continental scale or a New England scale. Um, and for American black duck, it seems to be reflected at every scale. So there's probably something that's much more worrisome going on with the black duck population that we need to look into. Um, and maybe in a more regional scale, we need to be looking at what's happening with these other species. So knowing how waterfowl are responding to changes in the environment of Narragansett Bay um, can maybe help us inform the trends, right? So I said earlier that there's all sorts of different um, interactions with humans and also uh, the environment that could cause changes in populations over time. Um, and so one of these things that could be happening um, is development of aquaculture in Narragansett Bay, which I'm now going to turn over to Martina to talk about. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I made a title slide to remind you of what the second part is about, um, which is looking at seasonal abundance of waterfowl in Narragansett Bay and just around the Rhode Island coast um, in relation to aquaculture development. Here we go. Great. So you heard a lot about how Rhode Island is quite important for wintering waterfowl, and that is true, um, but Rhode Island coastal waters are also really important for a lot of other water bird species and at different times of year. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm going to talk about is some of these seasonal patterns of like which water bird species we find when. Um, and yeah, we've seen some concerning trends about indicating population declines um, for a bunch of water bird species. And it just shows that we need to pay closer attention to how coastal development is impacting water bird species. And these annual accounts are really important and helpful for identifying trends over time. But we also really need detailed data about you know, where do water birds overlap um, with human uses of coastal areas, and how does our use of coastal areas impact water birds, and also how do birds impact human uses of the bay. And so this is a recent photo of Fields Point in Providence, and it shows a lot of the ways that humans are using coastal areas in Rhode Island currently, which have changed a lot over the last in decades and centuries, really. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on one aspect of um, coastal development, which is shellfish aquaculture. So this photo was, um, wait, hold on, let me, there we go. So this photo here, um, this was taken at the same place as the previous slide. So Fields Point in Providence about 100 years ago. Um, and you can see that um, the main industry in this area was very different at the time from these piles of oyster shells. And so shellfish aquaculture, especially oyster cultivation, was a huge industry in Rhode Island. Um, and it peaked around 1911. Um, and then it crashed in the 1920s because of pollution. So previously, in like the 1700s, people were just doing like harvesting of um, native oysters and they were actually over harvesting and that's why there was this shift into oyster cultivation. And so at the peak, over 20,000 acres of the bay were leased for oyster cultivation. Um, and so then it crashed for a good while and it's slowly been starting to make a comeback um, in the late 90s. Um, and you can see that, yeah, the industry is very slowly and gradually recovering and expanding its footprint in our coastal waters, and probably including areas that are important for water birds. Um, so most of the aquaculture in Rhode Island by far is oysters, so that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly, but there's some mussels and some clams and a little bit of kelp too, which isn't um, shellfish, but um, also is grown sometimes in some areas. Um, and so with aquaculture expanding in our coastal waters, 
This creates more and more potential for interactions with water birds, including conflicts. Um, but there's very little data to address even very basic questions about this. For example, is there spatial overlap? Sorry, I keep forgetting to advance the slide. So is there spatial overlap between water birds and shellfish aquaculture? And what times of year and which species groups? So we're trying to answer these questions by performing a bunch of water bird surveys all over coastal Rhode Island um, throughout the annual cycle to quantify distribution, abundance, behavior um, of water birds in relation to aquaculture um, and look at how it varies seasonally. So when we started the study, we actually knew very little about you know, how oysters are cultivated in our state, even though I've grown up in Rhode Island and eaten a lot of oysters in my day. Um, so I figured you could um, benefit from a little overview as well. So baby oysters start their lives um, in a hatchery when they're super tiny. And then when they've gotten to be a little bit bigger, they're placed into a nursery, an outdoor nursery, which is usually a container um, outside in the water where there's like a lot of water flow. Those are usually called upwellers. And it pumps nutrients through it, and the oysters grow really fast. Um, and so when they're about the size of a coin, that's when they're placed um, into an oyster farm. Um, and People use different methods for raising them to market size, but this is really kind of what is occupying so much space in our coastal waters, because it takes a lot of space to grow them from like the size of a coin to like a full oyster. Um, and they need space. You don't want to crowd them because then they don't get access to nutrients and that kind of thing. Um, and so this is the part that I'm going to be focusing on in this talk. And so, yeah, there's different ways of cultivating them. Um, so the traditional method, the original method, um, before there was you know all kinds of technological innovations in gear, um, was to just spread oyster seed, those baby coin-sized oysters, all over the bottom of a pond or the bay, um, and then wait a couple of years. It takes about two years at this latitude to grow oysters to market size, um, and then rake them up and you know sell them and eat them. Um, so this is a very cheap method because you don't need any gear. Um, and in a way, um, you know, there's no visual impact, like there's nothing you can see on the surface of the water. Um, and so there's very little conflict with other uses of those waters. Um, but these oysters have lower survival, and also they kind of, sometimes they stick together or grow into funky shapes. So these are kind of usually harvested for wholesale. They're not like as attractive for like a raw bar, for example. Um, and then another, form of submerged oyster aquaculture um, is placing them into trays or racks like this. Um, sorry. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Trays. I think you got it. Okay. Yeah, so placing them into trays. So trays are often just like placed on the bottom of the water, um, but they're like holding the oysters, so they're kind of elevated out of the mud, so they're less exposed to predators and parasites. They're kind of contained. It's easy to find them all again. Um, and yeah, so this method is often used in salt ponds and, and in parts of the bay, and they tend to have higher survival um, using this method. And then, I'm gonna get this soon. There we go. Okay, so another method um, of growing oysters is floating cages, and so this is becoming increasingly popular um, for a number of reasons. So, when oysters are grown on the surface of the water, they grow faster because um, the water is warmer, there's more nutrients and water flow. Um, and it's also more economical for the oyster farmer because it's just easier to access the oysters. They don't have to find them on the bottom of the, in the mud and like lift them up. They're just like right there on the surface. Um, and also the oysters have higher survival because there's fewer parasites because most of the parasites live in the mud. Um, there's less predation, um, and it's also just easier to maintain the cages um, because a big problem is fouling. It's when vegetation grows on the cages, and that prevents water flow um, and access to nutrients. So it's really easy to dry them and get rid of all that um, vegetation and maintain the cages. Um, so this is becoming increasingly popular. Um, and then there are actually some specialized types of floating cages, and this is just kind of interesting. Um, so these types of floating cages are um, placed in areas with tides. Um, they're attached to long lines. And so when the tide rises, 
it lifts um, the cages up and the oysters tumble. And what that does is it breaks off <laughs> it breaks off this growing edge. So oysters grow out, um, and this growing edge here is like kind of thin, and that breaks off. And so what it does is it produces a really beautiful round shape and a deeper cup, and it's like a much more attractive oyster to offer people at raw bar, and it uh, gives a higher price point. Um, so this is becoming a desirable way of growing oysters as well. Um, and as far as I know, this is, these methods have, are only used in Point Judith Pond. Um, this here is Love Hill Oysters. Um, this is me helping out. I was apprenticing on this farm. Um, so when we think of shellfish aquaculture as a type of coastal development, you know, what are some of the more general environmental impacts? Most of them are actually good. Um, cultivated shellfish um, sequester carbon. They improve water quality. And oyster farms actually even help protect our coastlines by moderating wave action. Um, but what about um, interactions with birds? That's what we're here about for. Um, so I should tell you, and you probably know this, that the only bird in Rhode Island that actually can directly eat an oyster is an American oyster catcher. Um, and so that's not usually like the big issue that we're worried about in terms of bird um, oyster interactions. Um, but there are other things. So for example, um, shellfish aquaculture could potentially be um, that vegetation grows on and it attracts invertebrates, which in turn it attracts fish. Um, and so it might be a desirable place for water birds to forage. Um, also, the floating cages on the water, you may have seen birds roosting on them before, so it could be you know, an attractive roosting location for water birds. Um, on the other hand, you know, oyster growers working in their aquaculture areas could disturb birds and potentially displace them. So there's a number of types of interactions um, that we were looking at before. So where is all this aquaculture? Um, here is a map here um, of aquaculture currently active in Narragansett Bay. So all these blue rectangles. And you can see that a great deal of it is clustered in Dutch Harbor and Jamestown and at Rome Point. So if you've ever been birding at Rome Point on the beach, um, you can see like a lot of floating gear. Um, both of these places actually have a considerable amount of floating gear, so it's really um, easy to see. You can even see it like when you're driving over the bridge to Jamestown um, from the mainland. And then you can see it's also expanding northward along Aquidneck Island and into the Sakonet River. Um, and we expect it to expand even more, and so that's why we're doing this study, is to you know, get some data on like, what the impact could be as it expands. Um, so we can inform the site of the future aquaculture development. Um, and then this here shows you the distribution of um, active aquaculture on the southwestern coast. So you can see there's a, a lot of aquaculture in our coastal salt ponds. Um, so we have Winnipeg, Quantigapog, Minigrit, um, Potter Pond, and Point Judith Pond. So when we did our water bird surveys, um, we included almost all of those aquaculture areas, um, but also a bunch of areas without aquaculture. And in this map, you can see the um, aquaculture areas have like blue names, um, and then the areas, the black names, those are areas without aquaculture. So we try to have a balance of both, and also just try to cover a diversity of coastal habitats, and also cover the important bird areas, water bird areas um, in the bay. And then, these are our sites on the southern coast where we did bird surveys. Um, so we covered all the coastal ponds, um, including ones without aquaculture like Truston Pond, and then also some other important bird areas like Napa Tree and Point Judith, um, Lighthouse, etc., and Black Point. So I'm going to show you a close-up of one of our survey sites um, that, again, you're probably familiar with. This is Rome Point. And you can see the aquaculture areas in blue. And then we have all these like survey grids around it too. Um, and why do we have all these grid cells? Um, the reason is so when we were doing our water bird surveys, we were scanning the entire area. And we would count um, number of species, the species, the number of birds, record the sex and the behavior of these birds. And then we'd assign it a location. So we would identify um, and estimate which location it was in. 
Um, so each grid cell had a unique identifier. And so sometimes, you know, there'd be a lot of zeros, and then sometimes you'd have like 12 red-breasted mergansers foraging in an aquaculture area, or like 100 scoter resting out on the water. So that's kind of what the data looks like. Um, and the reason why we used this survey grid method is we wanted to um, compare bird concentrations in area with aquaculture to areas without aquaculture. Um, so that lets us sort of get an average bird density for an area with floating gear and compare it to average bird density to an area with submerged aquaculture, or compare um, bird density in areas with floating gear to areas far away from aquaculture. Um, so that's the reason why we des designed the study this way. So before I get into that data, um, I just want to remind us that uh, most water bird species are highly seasonal. Um, and this figure here just shows relative abundance of five really common water bird species um, in Rhode Island throughout the year. And again, you can see that you know, different birds are around at different times. And this translates to species groups as well. Um, so for example, waterfowl, so ducks, geese, um, including diving ducks and dabbling ducks, um, they're present in the highest numbers in coastal areas in, win in the winter months. And then species like gulls, terns, and cormorants um, are most detectable at the highest numbers in coastal areas in what we could call the post-breeding period, so in late summer, early fall. And then that leaves um, the breeding period when kind of all species groups are just less detectable in coastal areas. And so, just to kind of summarize, um, in terms of large numbers of birds, there are two important seasons and associated species categories. So in late summer, um, early fall, so the post-breeding period, we tend to see the most gulls, turns, and cormorants. Um, and then in the non-breeding period or winter time, we tend to see the most waterfowl. So I'm going to talk about these two um, species groups separately because of their sort of seasonal segregation, um, but also because we expect them to interact with aquaculture differently. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. So again, I don't think I need to go through this again, we'll just maybe briefly, we use this kind of color scheme um, to, um, this is why, okay, yeah. Um, like the red line would be like birds um, in, found in, like in floating gear. Um, so anyway, we have like different colors associated with different distances from aquaculture um, in the next figure. And the legend's over here so you can remind yourself of what those colors are. But basically, this figure is showing us that bird density for gulls, turns, and cormorants is very high, but on floating gear only um, in the late summer and early fall, what we call the post-breeding period. So we had densities of birds um, as high as 5,000 birds per square kilometer. Um, herring gulls and cormorants were kind of consistently present in, in the whole like summertime, but these big peaks here are due to common terns and laughing gulls mostly, and that includes many hatchier birds. And it seems that they aggregate um, on floating year areas or on floating oyster farms um, after they leave their breeding sites and prepare for fall migration. And so, yeah, this is a photo from Rome Point, um, sort of during the height of like when the terns were sitting on the floating gear. And it has raised some concerns for regulatory agencies um, tasked with food safety. Um, just because you can see, I mean, there's so many birds and they're defecating on the gear, and it's also that time of year when um, the water is warm, you know, and conducive to bacterial proliferation, and we eat oysters raw for the most part. Um, and so it's sort of a convergence of unfortunate variables, and in some parts of the country that have really been, you know, con contamination incidents um, and illness, and so far here in Rhode Island, we really haven't had much of that at all, but still there's just no data on it, and so, um, you know, it would be great to follow up with some studies of water quality and find out, you know, how fast are um, bacteria actually proliferating 
Um, but the aquaculture industry has been very proactive about this, and so the oyster farms are testing all kinds of bird deterrents already. So when you go out to the oyster farms, you you know they're trying to come up with bird deterrents that don't really bother the birds, but it just makes it a little bit less desirable to sit on the gear, and they'll choose like another place. So sometimes you'll see like long zip ties attached to floats. Um, pointy cones that make it a little uncomfortable to sit, um, or sometimes even like moving gull sweeps that are wind propelled and it sort of sweeps the birds off. Um, <laughs> so what about waterfowl? How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so when we look at waterfowl, we see a very different pattern. So first of all, of course, um, they're present in the non-breeding period mostly, uh, so in the winter months. And also, we don't really see any differences in densities between aquaculture areas and areas away from aquaculture. So that tells us two things. It tells us that birds aren't particularly attracted to aquaculture, but they're also not really being displaced by it. Um, so it doesn't indicate that there's, you know, humans working in oyster areas are in some way disturbing them and um, pushing them out of those areas. And we did collect behavioral data, actually. Um, so we haven't analyzed that yet, but it'll be interesting to see that, see whether um, the birds that are present in aquaculture areas, are they spending more of their time foraging um, or resting? You know, are they spending their time there differently, even if they're not spending more time or less time there? So there's one more um, farm I want to tell you about. It's a kind of a case study um, that's sort of unique and interesting in our state. Um, so it's a shellfish farm, but it's the only active mussel farm in Rhode Island. Um, it is quite a big farm. You can see this is the largest blue rectangle on our map. And it's right on the west side of the Quidnick Island. And this is what it looks like from the coast. So there isn't really too much to look at. There's a lot of buoys, occasionally a boat working. Um, and then that's Prudence Island out in the distance. And on the surface, the farm actually has a bunch of floating oyster cages. So we see the expected pattern um, with gulls and terns roosting on the gear in the post-breeding period. Um, but underwater, there's a lot going on. Um, you can't really see it from the surface. You just see a bunch of floats like you saw in the photo. Um, but there's mussels um, growing on long lines under the water. And I'm going to explain how that works because that's something I also didn't know about until I got into this project. Um, so, a little background on how mussels are grown, um, which is totally different from oysters. So it takes about a year and a half at this latitude to grow mussels to full size. In the first winter, what they do is they just place um, rope attached to those long lines in the water, and they just wait. Um, and actually, the, the mussel seed will naturally settle on the rope, so they don't have to bring in their own seed or anything. It's already present in the water column. And then it's, it settles, um, and then it starts growing throughout this period here. So um, the summer months is when the mussel seed is really small and growing up. Um, and then by November, it reaches about 35 millimeters. It's like quite densely clustered. So they need to harvest and replant it on grow out rope. So this is what it looks like when it's still kind of small in the summer months. And then it gets larger. When it gets larger, um, it gets replanted and then it grows to full size. Um, during the winter months of the second year. And so then they're harvested usually the following May when they're about 60 millimeters. Okay. Um, so having an underwater mussel farm has actually really been a struggle for the silks family. Um, they've been in an ongoing battle with common eider for quite some time. So they've had this mussel farm already in a number of other areas and unfortunately, the common eider keep finding it. And um, in one winter, they decimated their entire stock. Um, and this also happens to, yeah, so common eider, I mean, like I said before, like other waterfowl, they tend to be in Rhode Island mostly in the winter months. Um, and this actually happens to be when mussels are pretty large. If you remember, I said in the winter months, that's when they're growing to full size. Um, and so common eider and other diving ducks can actually eat a full size mussel, but not as many of them, they're not as digestible because the shells are thick, they're just like a lot to swallow. Um, and so they can't do as much damage to a mussel farm during those months. 
So that seems like good news for the muscle industry, right? Um, but unfortunately, Rhode Island has a resident breeding population of common eider. Um, so where do they hang out? Well, they actually hang out at the Silks Muscle Farm, um, which seems like no coincidence. Um, so their presence in or detectability is actually highest um, in the breeding and post-breeding period. And unfortunately for silks, um, yeah, this is when the muscles are small and very desirable prey. So this was a surprising finding for us um, that there is a potential for you know increased conflict between common eider presence and muscle farms um, as the resident common eider population grows. Um, but it's not happening in the winter months like we expected, but in the summer months. So to wrap up, um, to return to our main questions, is there a spatial overlap between water birds and shellfish aquaculture? Yeah, there is. Um, so gulls, terns, and cormorants, they use floating oyster farms uh, through sting sites in, their, in the post-breeding period. Resident common eider are also attracted to and most likely forage on cultivated mussels during the post-breeding period. Um, and then other winter waterfowl are present in aquaculture areas, but not in higher numbers but also not in lower numbers. Um, and so if you want to you know, ask and, and think about you know, how water birds and aquaculture impact each other, um, the birds roast, roosting on floating oyster farms can potentially undermine water quality. It's something that we should collect more data on. Um, so this just needs further research and also developing effective bird deterrents um, and working with oyster farmers to yeah, help mitigate the uh, impact of birds. And on the other hand, floating farms may be important roosting sites for birds pre-migration, and there are parts of the world where actually people use floating farms, um, and particularly in the Asian Australasian flyway, they create artificial um, sort of like roosting platforms using floating oyster cages for birds to use as stopovers on their migration. Um, so, you know, potentially could even, you know, work for conserving migratory species. And um, so far, we don't really see any indications of human activity disturbing um, birds in the winter months. Um, winter months are also when oyster farms are not out there doing that much work. Um, they're just letting the oysters grow, and they want to be out there as little as possible because it's very cold. Um, but also, there's just not that much work to do other than harvesting. Summer is when you're planting seed and um, doing all the maintenance, etc. Um, and finally, it does seem like common eider are a significant obstacle to the development of successful mussel aquaculture in Rhode Island. Um, and so we need future research on the effectiveness of above water and below water bird deterrence. So yeah, that's um, all I have to present. I just would like to thank the immense survey crew um, that was collecting this massive amount of data, um, including Lincoln, who uh, volunteers here. He's still helping us out with some water for all surveys. Like everybody in my lab pitched in, um, and it was a huge effort. So yeah, thank you for your attention, and Claire and I will be happy to take some questions. Not that I've seen or really heard of. It, I haven't heard any reports of it. I haven't seen it personally or heard it from like any of the technicians who are out there all the time surveying them. Um, there isn't too much for them to get caught on. They're really just 
flipped, I mean, I guess they're like the, the cages themselves, and sometimes they're flipped so the cage is actually exposed on the water surface, and the birds will roost on that too, and yeah, I've never heard of any incidents where their like, feet getting caught or anything like right. that. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> yeah, um, I really appreciate both presentations together uh, as one. Uh, first of all, thank you. And second, uh, earlier on in, in Peter's, both your presentations, you alluded to the point that uh, some of the diving ducks, uh, or dancers perhaps, the, the fish eaters, might be attracted to the deer because there'd be more fish in the area. But then you began to aggregate it as just sort of ducks in general. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about what you didn't present, if, if you have anything about specific species like birdians or like red-breasted birdians and their behavior of foraging near those sites. I haven't analyzed um, it by species yet. So it's possible um, that that signal just disappears when we aggregate all the birds together, all the diving ducks. So it could be. Um, and there are papers that show that there is a higher density of fish and more like this potentially desirable prey present in aquaculture, submerged aquaculture, and sometimes Florida in aquaculture too. So yeah, um, it's totally possible that red crests. And we just anecdotally we see them out there, you know, but yeah. Um, so we'll, next year when we come back, we'll be <laughs> Yeah, you'll get the update. Okay. Yeah, stay <laughs> tuned. <laughs> I know the Department of Health regulates shellfish harvesting areas, natural harvesting. Uh, do you know if they're looking at aquaculture areas <clears throat> separately? Um, yeah, like well, water quality? Um, there is water quality monitoring, especially when there's like, an area of concern because there is a higher bird density. Um, and so there may be certain things that like trigger extra water quality monitoring. And I'm trying to remember, does anyone else from my group remember if um, they are just monitoring water quality in aquaculture? There is not regular monitoring of, yeah. of aquaculture. It is only in response to concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I have noticed this year the fewer harlequin ducks in the room, just anecdotally. I'm not wondering if anyone in the room knows, like, I'm thinking because it's such a warm winter, why bother from all the way around if there are harlequin <laughs> ducks? Um, or, you know, or other um, sea species. And then widgeons and gadwall and hoodies, they like to be on freshwater. You know. So the fact that thing is frozen yet, you know, or the last two winters have been relatively mild. Yeah, so it's that a little, skews that data. It part. does a little bit. It's a little hard to sort of tease that apart in the because it is only both surveys are conducted on one day in oh, right, right. the winter. Yes. Um, so a little bit separate from what the Martinez data can show. Um, mm -hmm. So I think if we work together, <laughs> we utilize some of her data to see if there's movement um, within. Unfortunately, it's just not how the survey is conducted. So right, right. it could be that there's more open water elsewhere um, because the years have been warmer more recently, and that might be what's driving the decline. Um, but it also could be something else that's going on in the bay. And I'm sort of hesitant to draw any firm conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as the, have you done any correlation between? Uh, the hooded bird answer, the red breasted bird answer population, excuse me, and DEM's monthly fish trawls on the bay. <laughs> and that is the, is the decline uh, a food issue in the wintry ground, or is there something else happening in the breeding ground that's affecting the winter population? Yeah, so I haven't done that yet. It's a good idea. Again, this is, it would be nice. Yeah, I guess it's actually. Something I could look at because we could look at just average numbers of fish across the year and see if that's affecting what's happening on that one day that things are being conducted. Um, it is a little bit nice because um, Christmas bird count and the waterfowl survey tend to be on separate days um, in a given year, so um, they're both in the winter, usually early in the year, but they're not on the same exact day, so it's not, you know. If, if the trends are very similar in species between those two types of surveys, that's why we wanted to do that to sort of make it a little bit more robust. But yeah, it would be interesting to look at, you know, if there's declines in certain fish species, and I, 
I can do it. <laughs> so we'll see the both of you next year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so did I understand you correctly to say that because of Bill Silks's muscle farm or the Silk family that we now have a year-round population of common either? Is that correct? I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't blame them. No, no. <laughs> or give them credit even. No, I think no. that... It, 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 we, it, we seem to have a year-round population of common either. So that begs the question, um, mm -hmm. are they breeding during their normal breeding months? And if so, how do they breed in heat? hot water and hot air, because aren't they a, a tundra breeding, traditionally a tundra breeding species? I mean, how far north do, do uh, common eiders migrate normally? There's a, there's a breeding population in Boston Harbor. Okay. And has been for quite some time. Okay, and we, so, so we they actually can... suspect that they are starting to breed further south, maybe as much as Vermont. So they can tolerate warm temperatures for breeding purposes, obviously. Traditionally, does anyone know where a common eider traditionally breeds? Is it further north? In the, the 30s and 20s latitude? latitude? Yeah, maritime areas all the way up through Canada. Right, so like, you know, 20 degrees latitude. So, so there, that, there is a species that because of uh, man-made conditions in this particular case, they're actually breeding further south now. Yeah, eider are also unusual amongst a lot of waterfowl in that they have um, they have many different breeding populations, and those breeding populations tend to be pretty Catholic about where they go in the winter. Mm. So the population at large is actually composed of a lot of subpopulations, mm. and so the fact that we now have some that are breeding further south in southern New England probably means that they're going to stick around and. Maybe this is close to a non-migratory population. Uh, it might go with it. So they have been documented breeding here in Narragansett Bay. Nests, the whole nine yards, fledgling. Peter, would you say that? Peter is the author of the Breeding Bird Atlas of Rhode Island. Yeah. So he was a condo. And I should say that the population in Boston Harbor they were introduced as a breeding season. There wasn't a natural rain spread, they were introduced to start a breeding population. Yeah, they got a jump start in Buzzard Bay yeah. uh, in the late 1970s. A guy named Bill Stanton, who was a professor out at uh, Framingham State College, he took some common eider eggs from Maine and put them under other ducks and so forth to get them started. So yeah. they got started in Buzzard Bay, and almost concurrently with that, there were common eiders that were starting to move into Buzzard Bay and Boston Harbor. The 70s was the critical sort of decade when they really moved in. And now um, they breed in almost all of the Essex County, Massachusetts offshore islands. There are a number of islands in Boston Harbor where there's a substantial population. They've expanded, and they've been meeting in Buzzards Bay for quite a while, and now they're spilling over into Rhode Island. So it's in the face of climate change, this is a species that seemingly is, is defying it and going the other direction. But to the question earlier about how far north do they go, they go north well, practically all the way up to the Arctic. And they are about as marine as any of the sea ducks. I mean, they don't nest inland on the tundra. They're not a warrior nester. They're always within sort of sight and sound of salt water. So they have been interesting species. The other thing about them that's different that may also be contributing to what you were just saying about the fact that they have these sort of subgroups. They're colonial breeders. Most ducks are not, not like geese, for example. So in many areas, eiders nest on islands that will be inhabited by lots of pairs. And in countries like Iceland, where eiders are actually propagated in effect for their down, mm -hmm. a lot of farmers have as a cottage industry that have, you know, they're doing sheep or whatever on the mainland. If there are little islands off the coast, they'll sort of prepare these, these islands to make them suitable for nesting eiders. And the eiders will take advantage of them and then they can harvest the down from nests. Mm -hmm. they, they take the down twice out of the early part of the season because the female eiders use their breast down to make the nest. Their, their nests are completely made out of feathers. And then after the eiders are fit, they let them finish nesting and they pledge, then they collect the whole nest. Mm -hmm. And they, they take these, you know, bags of, of eider down to these communes in the back where it's cleaned and washed and, and prepared for distribution and sale. Very expensive, tremendous.
tremendously valuable as an insulating material for things like puffs and, and markets and things of that sort. A lot of it's exported actually in Asia from Iceland. But the same thing is done in the Faroe Islands, off Britain. They're an interesting job, quite different than a lot of other water wells. But their, their presence in Rhode Island and, and southeastern Massachusetts and all is uh, relatively recent, although they were always there in huge numbers of women. Big numbers with, with women. Nantucket and Martha Vineyard, the areas off the elbow of the Cape, Monomoy Island, huge numbers, thousands of riders. And sometimes they'd get into trouble if there was an oil spill, that kind of thing. So they, 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 are, they are interesting, but their biology, so to speak, has really changed in recent years in terms of their adaptation to uh, areas where the water is a lot warmer than what they're probably used to. I was just distracted by a cat outside and they missed it, but mm -hmm. what was Stanton's original intent for establishing those original eggs? Was that a historical range that he was restoring? No, no, that was really more of an experiment, I believe. I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of a, let's see if we can do this. Because there was no reason really to think. It wasn't like, you know, bringing in weasels or something to a turn colony. It was, it was a benign endeavor. And because the eyes were so common in the winter anyway, and there'd always be a lot of non-breeders that would stick around in the summertime, it seemed like a viable thing to try, and it worked. Mm. Well, would, would the niner population travel far from where this um, mussel farm is? Because I've seen eider with ducklings in Little Compton. Right. Exactly. So would they would they travel that far, or are they more localized? What's the age groups that are typically seen at the silk farm? Um, in the summertime, it's usually um, some adults. But then I see ducklings and I see, yeah, hatcher birds that are like bigger. Well, that's another interesting part of the fact that they're somewhat colonial. Um, male eiders are very delinquent dads. And they bail <laughs> almost immediately. So that what female eiders, if you really want to see this in spades, is go up along the coast of Maine and further up into the maritime Canada because you see these huge flotillas of eiders, big brown ones and little brown ones. And it's, it's a daycare setup where the female will bring multiple broods together and they will tend a whole bunch of ducklings, which are essentially independent. I mean, they, they're, they're precocious to that extent. But you won't see any drapes around at all. So that's, that's what's going on. So. Thank you. I see one more question. So I'm curious about the silks. Do they, are they deterring the animals in any way? Are they permitted to protect their crop? I don't think yet, but they're exploring what their options are. Yeah. And they're like trying to work with their researchers to come up with a solution.